Both Freud and Lovecraft map negativity as a substantial force which creates worlds and defines fantasy. But Lovecraft can be said to map the substantial elusive nature of self-interest as a Freudian molecule, something which contains both wonder and death and ex expansion. To be in line with material, the horror narrative cannot simply be rejected when death emerges to assert its existence, unless the will to stay alive is itself negated. So this is a bit of an obtuse passage, maybe, but it kind of goes with the theme, and I think we'll cover this more thoroughly, which is there's an idea that to treat self-interest rationally, you have to kind of treat this psychoanalytic reflection as uh, rational and these creations of uh, negative or horrifying uh, items as rational but not understood. Right, which I think there's a kind of diremption there, you would call it a split into two, which is self interest is rational, right? But it doesn't mean it's understood as total. And that's kind of a, a bit of a setup. So, as we kind of go through this podcast, I think we can bring up a lot of different items or a lot of different topics. And you can use your skill as a machinic unconscious psychoanalysts and me as the psychotherapist who's psychoanalytically informed. And we, we can actively participate in self-interest, which we, by the way, can never escape from, but that's another thing. But we can rationally reflect and be in line with its processes. And when you know what's happening, then you can work out the true contradictions of reality instead of working in semblance. I think this book is like an escape from semblance. I think a lot of philosophy is escape from semblance, right? And this book is uh, in line with that kind of idea, which is reality is somewhat of a semblance there are some more real processes going on. The very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can change the whole state of things in pure violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens then is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. As always, we are sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's guest, just want to mention we've got a Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. -H. Consider throwing us a buck a month. Join the Fate Akeen. We're very thrilled to bring back friend of the show, dialectical dream theorist himself, Mr. Elliot Rosenstock, to discuss his new book, The Ego in Its Hyperstate, a psychoanalytically informed dialectical analysis of self-interest. Welcome back. I'm happy to thrill you, Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, we're uh, participating in intercourse. As a, in, in, the, a, in, in a Sternarian a, way, right? A, a Sternarian intercourse. Exactly. My, my intercourse. It's a Congress <laughs> of Minds. <laughs> congress of Minds. There you go. A multiplicity, a, a little assemblage. A mind congress. We've got our uh, little Oedipal triangle here. Who's the dad? Who's the mom? And who's the, who's the son? <laughs> I, I want to be the Egyptian sun god. That's that's what I want Right, be. yeah. The Aten. <laughs> You can be the deterritorialized priest, Imhotep. <laughs> In, Imhotep. There you go. I'll, I'll be the I'll be the the rational sun symbol that you know it's projected that, 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 that destroys symbol yeah. civilization. I said symbolization there. A little bit of a slip. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. I like it though. I try to yeah. contain the like overwhelming aspect. Try to code the flows. Yeah, code the flows. That example you bring up. I'm not sure if it's, it's very early on in the book, maybe chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, this notion of the, of, of, as you brought up, you know, the sort of the, the shift in from the shift towards an almost anthropomorphic symbolization of, of raw, right. You know, with the circle, with, with little rays coming out of it, with the end in hands, you know, and how this sort of, performs this kind of mediation or this this sort of rationalization that that actually I don't know it, it doesn't do justice right to the primordial 
what do you want? Just well, it's, vitality, it's, primordial yeah, that's vitality. A good, okay. that's, that's a, a good, tough that's concept, good. right? Yeah. That's why. Yeah. That's why it's in this book, which is like a critique of a critique of a critique of a critique of like what is self interest, right? Uh, so ultimately, we're getting to why is why is the sun with hands cringe and not based? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right? Well, so like, so if you if if we in the process of figuring out this. A stumble a little bit it is understandable because we are we are on the like fifth uh, level of removing semblance from uh from reality here right. we're f- uh, we're five dimensions removed <laughs> from the cave or something or five yeah exactly we're out five, sta- a- <laughs> five standard deviations from the plato's cave we're already outside of the cave and they already made a metaverse and we've already broken through that metaverse and then are rematricized. So we're already there, and now we're revisiting the cave in like right. the third Mark Zuckerberg's <laughs> Pache Baudrillard. We're, yeah. we're we're cutting through the, the levels of simulacra, <laughs> diving through them. Turns out it's actually cake. Yeah, right. When you it's cut cake, into it, cake, when cake you cut all the way it. down. Yeah, it's cake all the way down. Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting because just because the whole theory is that self-interest is rational or has a rationality, but that's very different than the idea that you will then be able to make known things to a general audience writer, uh, general people. And uh, what you're actually doing is if you were rationally examining your rationality, negating the negation or positing the posit, really, you would see that you're changing the thing you're making entirely and uh, vitally removing these narratives, the symbolization uh, potential. And then the person who's that, uh, you know, the priest who comes in and does that falls shortly after his it, cult it, fails. That notion of the of why the the sun symbol in its kind of anthropomorphic human dimensions with the hands is cringe. It reminds me I had a hermeneutics professor who was well, I had a professor like intro to critical theory, right? Which is like a like first semester grad school and hermeneutics was her background that was her thing like medieval semiotics and just that's pretty much all we got in that class and she was obsessed with this this monk whose name I don't remember and don't really give a shit about but the one concrete example I took from her always talking about this fucking monk was he was overwhelmed by these mandalas and just crippling like paralysis Coop I've probably told you about this before I probably said it but the way he got back some semblance in a different sense, some even like the smallest amount of agency was to start drawing these. And he started drawing these and painting them. And once he had kind of perfected the representation of these overwhelming images, the visions, his hallucinations, paralysis stopped and he was able to function again. So I kind of thought about this yeah. example when you were talking about this kind of sapping of primordial vitality of, of Sun Ra, you know, in, in his awesome presence versus the, the little, uh, well, yeah. whether it be a hieroglyph well, or whatever. Well, the leader, it's interesting because maybe in terms of what is psychoanalysis, you're speaking, you're speaking the thing, you're making positive these kind of right the negative of the will is like a big theme of this which is which uh, is basically positing basically everything in psychoanalysis pretty much is in negative space so but if you're a leader right and you put into the world this kind of vision which is like i'm trying to make sense of our people's story and history and you put forward a vision and um that vision doesn't actually sustain the story then it you know then it collapses right unfortunately is this still kind of in this era where we're talking about the the downfall of meta narratives and like the proliferation of the little narratives or is is this still in dialogue with that this is sti- shift or, or or is this kind of is this that is still ancillary? talking about the ancient world right in terms of right i think this i meant your book but yeah the, oh the book the book right but no you can go I, on I with, your, with your with your you can go on with your other thought though about about I, ancient thought well i think the book is not really engaging so much with the history of philosophy insofar as it's engaging with this particular idea of self-interest and trying to remove all semblance as much as possible. Right. I remember we were talking about, we were talking about something. I, I lost it. I'm going to try to make this psychoanalytic. So what I've forgotten something, right? So here, here's a moment. Here's a psychoanalytic moment. I've like, fully blanked. 
Well, no, I, <laughs> I had something like I had something in its hole that I was confident about. And then we hit on this kind of line of flight. This, yeah, this philosophical history thing. And then I just blanked. You were kind of talking about the way the leader is able to succeed or not in synthesizing some sort of narrative or some sort of overarching kind right. of thread, some kind of guiding thread for right. for the people's the in, yeah the individual psychoanalytic right 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 the yeah. individual psychoanalytic moment is not necessarily the social or the big other psychoanalytic right. moment right so right. you might be lucky enough to be a leader and have a have a moment of truth where you traverse your fantasy and you come mm-hmm. to a conclusion and then you present it but actually the thing you're presenting it collapses within this kind of other structure, right? And I think that's another thing that the hyperstate tries to cover, which is there is this there is this kind of uh, general psychoanalytic subjectivity mm-hmm. uh, that can there are various psych, you know subjectivities that can be treated psychoanalytically, and the addition of one thing which might have cured an individual psyche is uh, you know a symptom in this other thing, and depending on a, a power relation, it will turn out a variety of different ways. I was going to ask what you think about this relative to, you know, like I said, we've been investigating anti-Oedipus. We've talked, actually talked about the ancient Egyptians a little bit in the sense of, I guess there's a lack of an individual fantasy, right? At that point, there's no individual fantasy. It's all the whole body without organs is working towards the immortality of itself, right? Like it's going towards, I guess you would say, you know, in the Hegelian sense, universal spirit is the is the Pharaoh and the whole process of getting the Pharaoh to experience infinity of the afterlife. And through that sort of recultivate the soil of the social for the Egyptians. Not to be like Richard Dawkins, but the problem (laughs) is that's not, it's not real, is it? I mean, if you are working towards that, you know, you, you, I mean, the despot doesn't consciously, does the despot constant consciously will their own, or is it something else going on? Like well, I, this you, an, yeah. example of Otten taking, you know, taking this radical departure in terms of the religious dogma of ancient Egypt and trying to shift that. Where does that come from? Where does that energy well, come from? Well, you might say it's the death drive, right? In terms of there is a death drive. There's, you know, in terms of why I don't think of this book as a history of philosophy, I'm like kind of, I'm kind of, what's the word? I'm trying to not just say pretentious because that's not quite it. I'm not trying to say unlearned because I, I like I feel like I want to use a bunch of insult words towards myself because it's fun to because it's fun to talk shit about yourself, guys. But I am pausing that these are universal kind of things which will reappear and they have enough uh, universality to them that they would be relevant in ancient Egypt and it'd be relevant now. What we're talking about right now, it reminds me of what Zizek always likes to bring up, which is that. Hegel always says that the secrets of the Egyptians was secret for the Egyptians themselves, right? So you got to like transpose the gap sure. back into where we think it is, back into the thing itself, right? Sure. And um, the historical conflict of the ancient Egyptians might be very difficult to parse as well in terms of what exactly was being worked out in the Hegelian right. sense there. But there's a problem with Hegel, right? Which is what's what's the problem with Hegel? Class consciousness, right? In terms of what kind of oppressions and injustices and mm-hmm. just ultra violence is being enacted that provokes people to do violence in turn to the state. You try to play Hegel off himself kind of towards the end. Do you want to say yeah, that? Everybody about that? does that. Though, well, yeah. yeah. And I mean, Jesus <laughs> yeah, himself, I do that too. <laughs> Jesus himself's like, all these places where Hegel isn't Hegel enough, that's... That's, that's like that's to misread that. Hegel because Hegel is a bunch of fits and starts, right? That's how Zizek oh, tries yeah. to like salvage it. But Oh yeah, the, the key, by the way, to quoting Zizek for the rest of your life without uh-huh. citing him is write a book called Zizek in the Clinic. And then uh-huh. once they say you're plagiarizing <laughs> Zizek, you say exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not plagiarism, it's, it's, I mean, you know, like it's, it's, you know, it's. I'm, it's, I'm a subcat, I if you only categorize myself. If you only steal like <laughs> one or two ideas, you're plagiarizing. But if you steal a whole kind of look at art if you still at all exactly. right you're 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 doing scholarship <laughs> you're a great exactly. artist right that's even how the Liz and guattari talk about i mean guattari called himself a, a thought thief right he a he, thought he called himself, himself a, a thought, thought. <laughs> yeah he called he goes he calls himself as, he, as you know guattari he was a was conceptual a thief right <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Guattari, the liz talks about this in difference of repetition right that it's it, you know repetition goes by way of these thefts and even in when they talk about 
the primitive territorial machine, they they always say the it's less exchange that is primary. It's more of these things happen by gift and, and theft, right? That the gift, the spirit in which the gift is given has to be given in such a way that it's not presuppose that one can immediately like pay it back it's almost like one has to pretend like the gift given was like somehow surreptitiously taken without knowing speaking of, who speaking of repetition what do you think of uh, omicron omicron variant it feels like it has a li- bit less hype than delta i feel like delta was like the hype delta you know? was hyped up i think at this point we're we're you know <laughs> fatigue it, it, yeah it's the it's some variant getting, fatigue Getting fatigued with trying to learn Greek. What was his name? Uh, John, was it Ruben? Is that his name? One of the, the douchebags on the right who's, who was like, Omicron, Shramacron. Like, this is all this is all bullshit. And it's like, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, I was talking about earlier, all the, there's like millions of names for different phobias, for like particular phobias and how it's like a psyop to make us learn Greek. So this is like a psyop to get us to learn the Greek alphabet, right? Just the... COVID is vastly turning into meme territory. I don't know if it's like moving oh, it, away. It already was. From yeah, the it was yeah, meme ter- yeah, but it's like it was meme and lockdown territory. Like COVID was <laughs> right. keeping you in right. your house for months. And mm. now it's now I'm supposed to wear a mask on the bus, which I do sometimes. I do most of the time. I just got uh, my, my, my booster shot. So people, they're going to have to see my ugly face out in, in public. Like I'm, I'm boosted, you know, I'm so. Yeah. You know, you got to deal with the schnoz. Yeah. My mask has a mask, so. You double mask it, Biden style. I mean, I'm talking about my metaphorical mask yeah. that I, I, that I, I the I, persona I, I take on. <laughs> oh, you're ma- oh, you're like, you're like metaphorical mask. Speaking of metaphorical mask, did you ever see Host, which is the COVID horror movie over Zoom? No, I have not. They have, okay, so in, in the Host, spoiler alert, I'm going to spoil this movie because it's also like, it seems. Yeah, I'm not going to watch it. So. Has a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes, but that's because it was in COVID times, and everyone was like, "Oh, it's the COVID horror movie." But there's this idea that you have a mask, and because you made up, you said you had a problem that wasn't real, right? This could be psychoanalytic in nature. This is psychoanalytic in nature, but of course, so is everything. This is very <laughs> philosophical, very psychological moment where this woman they're having a seance, and no one believes it's real, of course, because it's not. But in horror movies, you have to pretend that they are. And then right. they, they, right. they always have a moment where they look at the camera and they, somebody goes, I don't believe. And then the horror movie is based on the term, well, well actually, you're a fucking dumbass. Because you should have <laughs> believed believe it's real. And then they go, what? And then, then you identify with the person like, maybe I'm a dumbass because I don't believe. But you just have to suspend your disbelief enough right. to not be bothered too much when they turn to the camera because this is essential for a paranormal horror movie right every paranormal horror movie will have the moment well well this is all stupid where in that universe of course it's wrong in this movie host this woman pretends during a seance to be talking to a dead friend who doesn't exist and then and then the zoom call cuts and the idea is a demonic presence comes because you pretended to have a problem right you, fabric- you fabricated a problem so uh. Now we're already in ideology here, of course. Because you fabricated a problem, you have allowed anybody to then take this mask. Anybody from the spirit realm can now right. come up because you fabricated a person and you don't know who you called from the right. spirit realm. So this, I, there's this already this idea, which is, oh, don't lie, which is, of course. Well, Bojer, Bojer, read that <laughs> shit up because he would say like you're disrespecting the dead right you're doing the sure. thing that, that modernity does which is right cordoning off the dead they don't count we can make fun of them we can belittle them and so like you open up this so little many, gap problem, in reality yeah. that allows for the dead to show that they are and always have been like you the know, problem uh, here is of course the seance is already a lie there's a greater lie of uh spiritualism right but of course you lie about the lie if you lie during the lie, now you're evil. So there's a question of context, right? In terms of what is the lesson here, if there is a lesson. Well, there is a, there is a de facto lesson, even if they're not trying to impart this to you, which is, which is don't mock the ritual of the supernatural, of the large right. lie. Right. You can, I, I, you can I guess, say it's Lacanian, right? The non-dupe. Right. I guess that's kind of what I meant. The, the seance already presupposes that you're going to treat the, the other side the dead as though they they had a, a means with which to be symbolically exchanged 
And if you don't take that seriously, yeah. you're, you're kind of, you know, you're pulling on an oopsie. That's a good point in terms of treating the ritual of communing with the dead as not important. Right. right. So there's, there's another layer. But of course, communing with the dead is uh, impossible. There's these problems with the camera yeah. term, which is that- Only for you, the you conscious just, mind, right? Only and the unconscious for the conscious doesn't, mind. doesn't right. recognize death, right? We start getting sure. into the Freudian, That's you know, true. It, it becomes, the con- unconscious is like, what? You know, yeah, you, yeah. Could, you could argue it's the same material, synthetic consciousness. Mm-hmm. Your perception of the living is the same thing as, you know, the big other of the dead. So it is the same material. You can't talk to the dead, but in fact, someone passes away and you have a dream of them or you're, you think oh, yeah. about, you're engaging them with the same thing you engaged with when they were alive. So in that oh, yeah, case, yeah. That's, <laughs> that has not died. I talked to Coop about that uh, uh, when I was visiting in Austin. and We, we, we just had, talked about that in one of the episodes, I think. Yeah, we no, we got a dead relative, deep, I think. Yeah, we got deep into, this was the big chapter on death and symbolic exchange of death. But basically, Cooper and I exchanged the fact that I've had relatives die and, and I see them in my dreams. And Cooper really hasn't had the same life experiences, right, of, of having that Having a close experience. family member die and then right. you dream and then you wake up and you're like, oh yeah. That's so he just had to take my word on it. Maybe I was duping him. Who knows? Right? Well, eventually, he's, he's take ev- my word ev- on it. eventually we'll all have that dream. So right. not to rush it. Don't rush it. Plenty of time. Taylor mentioned a little bit about one of your moves to out Hegel Hegel. And I was thinking that that's a good way to think of the unique in its property as a book and trying to get Taylor to read that book and see <laughs> that that really is kind of what Sterner's doing because Sterner's oh. the, are certainly our patron saint, I think, for this episode, right? Sterner and Hegel, like, how about, in a, how about in a arm wrestling match? I'm gonna bring Ayn Rand for it because I just like to fuck with things. If Sterner's gonna be a patron saint of self interest, why not bring up Ayn Rand, who is similar? I mean, wrong about self interest, although hey, Sterner's a lot better than Ayn Rand, but this is a good point. I mean, <laughs> you know, she could have been a citation in your book just as easily. You know, because she is kind of a certain form of, you know, I'm not going to talk about objectivism because I think that's kind of a hollow term, but she is a kind of patron saying of a certain type of self-interest that at least has uh, a certain social capital and cachet during the time in which she was writing and still somewhat she had a huge for today huge following right compared, just for the compared with Sterner, the yeah. massive amount of influence Ayn Rand has had. Oh, yeah, yeah. Max Stirner is incomparable, uh, like heads of state of, are, of the U.S. And for the uh, outgrowth of capitalism, I mean, to a certain extent, like yeah. if Max Stirner is the repressed heretic of left Hegelianism, Ayn Rand is like the yeah. apotheosis <laughs> of a certain right Hegelianism for right. at yeah. least American intelligentsia. Yeah. Does well, that she, make sense? Maybe. Well, she's not a, a so. Hegelian, but she is. No, a, right. She is an egoist, right? Okay. Ayn yes, Rand right. is an egoist. Her That's idea of okay. egoism is, you know, if you look at it through my system, right, her articulations are immediately objectively valid because they are the initial objective grasp. Okay. That's her idea. So gotcha. she has this. She has this motivational speech idea, right? Which, uh-huh. is, yeah. Which is this is a fork. I grasp it as a fork, and I use it. And mm-hmm. this is this is its important thing. It's Heideggerian as well, so it makes makes sense. It's a little right wing, right? Because it is a focus on this on this idea, qualitative experience. You know, I always watch out for people who are trying to impose what they consider a qualitative life path onto you. That's like Jordan Peterson. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's yeah. like uh, that's like Heidegger. Uh, that's like lots of different theorists. People who I really like, actually, sometimes because they they posit an aesthetic is objectively true. So people who do that can be very cool, very like kind of interesting. They have their aesthetic. It's like different. They're like masters of it. And they Mm -hmm. say this aesthetic is not just my aesthetic. This is what is good. Yep. This is the objectively good or based. And what is outside my aesthetic is cringe. And when you really believe that, you can produce all these different things. So you know. (laughs) <laughs> well there's a sense me out a little bit i think oh, shit. There, well i don't think so but there, there is a sense in which ayn rand really vibes with your quote from the philosophy of right which is this hegel that wants to argue the individual sort of universally has this tendency towards subsuming under the state that's like their highest universal calling there is a sense in which ayn rand feels like 
you know, you, you don't even have to, you could, you could for the state there, you just replace it with capitalism or with self-interest, you know, realizing itself in capital accumulation. So I was just saying that you just replace the state with capitalism, you replace the individual with accumulation of capital or self-interest as the accumulation of capital. And Ayn Rand becomes, seems to like fit in with that view of a certain type of Hegelianism, even if she doesn't go by way of those categories or the movement of spirit or, or whatever. Sure. Insofar as Hegel is, as Sadler, Sadler said, and I'm glad he read read the book and liked it. Sadler gave me a strong recommendation, by the way. So if you like Greg Sad, if you trust Greg Sadler, you should buy my book. Is that a logic? Is that does that logical axiom have? Is have that in my so, Is it in my self interest to do so? Does that does that have any holes in it? Don't even worry about it. Just just listen to it. Just just follow the maxim. I think he's I think he's a worthy uh, I think he's a worthy trumpeter of, of your book. Yeah. I, I was so, glad so, that you, I was glad he liked it. So yeah, tell um, us about what, but, what, but the what point, Sadler, yeah. He says he liked that. It said it was, you know, logically sound that I said, Hegel says you should subsume yourself to the highest totality. But for Hegel, of course, the highest totality is the Prussian state, which he has a nice position in. So, okay. You have to take this into account. It's a simple. Yeah. And where's and the it, Prussian state now, Hegel? <laughs> exactly. Well, well, it's, it's, you know, it's this kind of basic ugly <coughs> notion, right? But the problem problem with ignoring it is you're building things which ignore this kind of basic right. notion of psychological egoism and you know his actions are within his self interest and you see that subsuming yourself to the highest totality is not actually what you really should do always right I think there's a question of subsuming yourself into different systems different groups like right now for instance we are a kind of assemblage mm-hmm. I don't really have any alternative motives maybe um, let's see my alternative motives is i'm i'm promoting a book right yeah i kind of like just talking and that's mm-hmm. that's kind of that's kind of nice intercourse uh, in, yep. inter- intercourse intellectual maybe. intercourse yeah <laughs> uh yeah. right right so transference you know, so, right? so, you know? yeah so there's a question of if i became a subject of this assemblage how would that change me how would that negate me so right now i'm a subject of a kind of cause and we're all talking about a cause but now I'm going to be a subject of this assemblage, which is Elliot Cooper Taylor. I want to ask, I want to ask both of you kind of the same question. I'll start with Cooper, just because Cooper was on first. You know, I don't know the different vital forces of making Taylor second or Cooper first. You know, these all could be examined, right? So this, we'll this, is, that this, out. this is how my <laughs> I'm offended. This, I'm, I'm personally offended. This is <laughs> this is how, this is also how neurosis, while rationally. You know, it is actually figuring out mechanisms can, right. like this is another theme in the book where the rational reflection might remove the power of the myth in the same way speaking in psychoanalysis removes the power of the symptom, right? Anyway, so, but because I am actually doing this, because my book posits an ego substance, right? The ego substance is my ego can, in fact, subsume myself to this assemblage. I'm, you know, I'm going to focus on Cooper and Taylor. So, so Cooper, in terms of, I know you do this podcast. I know you're, you're doing these intellectual projects. What's kind of the newest thing that's kind of caught your eye? Has something, anything besides me in this book? <laughs> I assume, assume you have a life outside of this, this one book. Besides what we're talking about now, what else has caught your eye kind of intellectually? Lately? Intellectually, lately, I think a lot of the anthropological stuff, since we've been delving into both anti-Oedipus and symbolic exchange and death, we also read Moses, the gift, and then Claster's society against the state. So that combined with my, you know, I've been a big Dune fan for years. And like just the last week or two, I've been reading through the audiobooks. And a lot of the material is very relevant to Dune because of the, there's alliance, there's tribal shit going on. There's, you know, a lot of the same kind of body without organs, you know, Hegelian question, et cetera, et cetera. And like understanding the death drive of the human race, let's say, you know, at the cosmic scale when you're talking about Dune. So that's kind of where my head's been. Well, that's cool. So anthropology and society, how does society against the state relate to like anthropology? Pierre Clasters was a anarchist anthropologist and, um, He's, Anarchist anthropologist. Sure. Taylor, you could probably step in here a little bit, but it's sort of talking about how basically the state was warded off by 
by pre-capitalist societies through like that's the whole thing with the social coding like they had a very strict social coding and marking of the body inscribing on the body but the body is let the body is ledger so that everyone can see you know we're all that's the binding material of the social is the pain of the ritual the articulation right and so <laughs> but, now that you know yeah. capitalism obviously breaks up those codes scrambles them overcodes them with its own machines and whatnot so I don't know, I think it's very interesting that the development of capitalism and how it's, you know, classers, I think, and also Deleuze and Guattari obviously think that capitalism is not a natural, like it doesn't have to occur. And they use the example of the Chinese shutting down their silver mines or something, and they sort of stop this, you know, rampant accumulation. And, In and the Taylor 14th had, century. Right. Yeah. Taylor has a great example, too, about this, about how, like, you know, current day China with the Great Firewall, et cetera, right. is another example of this. Way you bring up you bring up Nick Land coding. just to piggyback off of bringing up modern day China. You bring up the example of Nick Land in your book. Yeah, the, as the in, what Sadler didn't talk about was humanism versus inhuman, right? Sartre as the humanist, right? You could call Land like the inhumanist, right? A yeah, real, a I mean, process fetishist almost. It's kind of interesting because Sartre picks up from and Lacan falls us in this too by, by prioritizing the gaze of the other. This is where I think Deleuze becomes a little bit more interesting. And this is kind of where you can see the dotted line to Nick Land and the anti-humanism that we could, that you kind of use in your book to describe him, and which I don't think is, is incorrect. This notion that the, what Deleuze calls in his very first essay on the description of woman, which is Sartre in an essence, this notion of the a priori other, right? Or the other structure rather than the notion of falling back on the phenomenological intentionality of the gays is where we start to get into some of this anti-humanist stuff. But Coop, you're, you're right on it with this notion that, you know, China is still, and we see this in other states too. They're not, they're not the only one, but, right. but, but like, it's a good like, example. Yeah. But like carving out, carving out what the internet or the, or the web can allow in terms of this connectivity, carving out an own, its own. And Russia does this too, in a certain way. And I'm sure Many other states do this too, not to mention North Korea, which whose internet access were probably highly, highly limited, if non-existent. So you see these ways in which there are still these barriers that are that states kind of prop up in you know, they while states kind of like tap into the surplus of capitalism, they all they also help to provide the interior limits, you know, as it keeps yeah. expanding. Right, is these little stop caps. So I think with someone like Nick Land, we we kind of see again, as you put it, which was a nice quote, this notion that the human is like the thing that needs to go for capital to like really lift off. Yeah. The human security system, the coding of the flows, right? Yeah, but it's gonna prevent the excel slowing down like the it's the like well it stops it sometimes, right? But it's also the thing that propels it. I mean, true, and that and that is dialectical. Right, right. Like, for Land's rhetoric, of course. I mean, that's but that gets but that, that gets back to your notion of, of self interest because you're right. I mean, it's not like humans are are completely uh, are, are stateless societies and they're and they're warding off capitalism. I mean, we we do have we do still see that that tendency or at least that proclaimed tendency for certain projects. Vestiges um, of of those old machines still still kicking around on the outskirts, the periphery. Land wants as many techno bio forces to be pointed at uh, human evolution into their own destruction into robots, right? So there is this interesting, con there are of course lots of contradictions in Land because Land is like, he's for the good cause, quote unquote, of uh, being like, being a whack fascist. I mean, okay, he's not technically a fascist, this thing, for simplicity's sake, we'll just say he's very devoted to become being a whack fascist. He doesn't change from this devotion. So he's very useful in that way because he's very consistent, right? So with Land, I feel like why leftists like Land is because one, he's very consistent. He doesn't try to backpedal, right? So in terms of you're creating these moments of opposition where you can look at Land as this kind of very consistent bulwark of right-wing idealism and you can kind of uh, you can kind of address the various notions that he takes up so why is he for the destruction of humanity and the creation of robots and yet he has this kind of whole eugenics project right uh, a, a uh, intelligence eugenics project going 
I think there's there's these there's these questions of what exactly is intelligence winning, and I think land has uh-huh. this land has various ideas of what that means. But if you know, that's if, a good question. I like that. Yeah, it really puts yeah, it in perspective. Well, yeah, when intelligence wins, there's this question of, I guess, agency. Right. Have, that I think Land tries to ignore as much as possible. Yeah. Because that, that's kind of the transcendental method a little bit. Yeah. Um, so there's these. It's exactly intel. Intelligence is winning. What exactly? I don't know. Yeah. Um, what are the stakes involved? Yeah. I mean, you could obviously say immediately if, if, you know, you, your eugenics projects, then, in, then you create the singularity and wipe yourself out because you're, I guess you're desiring what you're doing then is you're becoming engaged with this cause of, uh, of birth. He's almost a caretaker. He's almost a mommy, <laughs> reactionary mommy there. Right. If, or he just it- want, where he really wants to give birth to these like fucking monsters. He wants to is be that a, a type mommy. of, is that a type of death drive? And it's oh sure, I, like right, well, it's like a self-negation, whole, it's a pure self-negation, right? In terms of, uh, I mean, that kind of makes sense because I, you know, thought about this, right? I thought about this. I thought about this actually. I was did some shrooms like around New Year's last year, and uh, I had this idea that the alien, the xenomorph in Alien, was the protagonist of the movie because humanity was weak and petty and, and so forth and was like caught yeah. up in its own bullshit and this oh, interesting and the creature idea. the creature is pure does will right Just like pure yeah. destruction right yeah. Power, well it's more powerful dest- or creative that. right like it, creative. it it sure. takes you you know it sort of it's almost a good it's a good metaphor for capitalism too because it like well eventually the overcoating the alien comes out of the out of the chest right exactly an alien there's right? a birth so right it's, it's a type of birth, birth yeah it's a nat- <laughs> it's a nativity scene actually yeah i mean the alien is, in terms of the alien is like the state also but it's like in the way that it's just more powerful than everybody right right yeah so <laughs> so you have well, this- and, and also there, there's a sense in which the alien is more honest about its desire yeah, that than- i think it's relative to yes mm-hmm. i think that's yeah. kind of the ethos because because was- ripley finds out that first of all you know there's an android on board and second of all their lives are not the priority right they don't mean shit to the corporation right the duplicity involved in their in their uh, occupation and they're being uh, you know paid to go on this whatever it is scratch whether whether it be to extract surplus value wherever the fuck they are kind of being being they're being, being fudged they're and they're being betrayed <laughs> by this corporation doesn't give a shit about them so there's a sense in which yeah. that that betrayal belies the fact that the corporation that should have their best interests uh, is even more alien than the xenomorph. Well, it's a ooh, classic. Ooh. Well, it's a, yeah. So well, it's nice. a classic double blackmail. The corporations, yeah. the corporation, you, you know, you, you involve yourself with a corporation and corporate interests because you have interests, which is a paycheck, which you don't right. intrinsically right. desire what the corporation desires. And right. Makes, you're some kind of freak and of course you convince yourself you do uh, many such cases <laughs> right 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 you're, you're, just in, you're just in it for the, the residual share but you're not you don't really whatever the end goal may well, be yeah that's that's ancillary and yet you know to carry it you you think that you that, that to carry out the goal your your lives are worth something and they clearly they're not so there's a sense yeah. in which the the xenomorph is much more honest yeah, and the, if the you could even say call it that, right? The double black. Well, they're not involved in the double blackmail right. Right. of a of a corporate power. But then there's this other problem, which is why do workers have to bear the brunt of the double blackmail? This yeah, is like right. the, This is like this is like the host, the liar, right? Uh, it's like okay, it's it's sure sure she's lying about a person for a seance, but in fact, the seance is itself mm-hmm. structurally just a gigantic lie as well. So. There's the, what is it? The You call it the beautiful mind of the alien because the alien is not involved with, you know, the dirty human affairs. Uh, you know, the alien can come in. It's just a pure force. It just wants, it's the animal force. It's a desire of nature, right? Nature comes up and it's more powerful than humanity, which doesn't happen a lot. Mm. Uh, Ripley, and, Ripley but herself. To, but we get to see it happen. Ripley herself in, t- <laughs> in, the, in Aliens, the sequel, says that, I think she says something roughly translating to there's something admirable about the fact that the aliens at least are not trying to fuck one another over for more yeah yeah right yeah. 
that's why the the relationship between Ripley and the cat that she saves is more emotionally like stirring than saving the child and aliens because there's a way in which Ripley reinforces the like terrestrial relationships between humans and certain animals for which we actually do care and take care of and don't necessarily use just for a certain surplus value, right? Like cats. Sure. Which, that we have other self-interests, you might say, which are like companionship love. and blah blah the love blah. Love. The love that that that, love. that that is and I totally don't, and alien. I don't mean and I don't mean cat fucking. But there but there is a there is a <laughs> there, it is interesting to think that the the xenomorph is honest in a way in which you know it's it's pure desire, pure will, as as Cooper was saying. But uh, I, I still recall in one of the short stories in the iRobot collection, Asimov kind of describes this point where, in one of the short stories, where given the three laws, you know, given this notion that you know robots aren't to like harm humans, they're supposed to blah, blah, blah. They, in the end, become domesticators of humans because humans have to be protected from themselves, right? They, and if you follow the three laws out to a certain point of the singularity of robotic intelligence, the robots domesticate humans and keep them, take away a certain amount of their freedom in order to protect them from themselves, whether it be ecological destruction or genocidal Well, there's a Well, there's the question of positive versus negative, right? Does that mean I am not... I'm a robot and I'm, I can't harm humans, then does that mean if I see that a human will be harmed, I have to save it? And then does that mean if I see structurally that a lot of humans will be harmed, do I have to save them? That means if I see this many or that many, then I have to make a utilitarian decision. Right. And so, so it quickly... It, it subsumes expands. all of humanity. It's a hydra. It keeps it from you could itself. Call it, right. Yeah. I like the hydra. Let's, let's <coughs> call these like hydra. They're like hydra philosophical problems that mm-hmm. ultimately you start to enter into them. Egoism is like that. That's why I wrote this book because I'm deep in the Hydra, but I'm fine with that. You could say that the, the three laws, the way that it's worked out in that kind of dystopian nightmare where the, the robots have to have to take take the freedom into their own hands to keep humans from harming themselves. You could say this is a question of the like dialectical contradiction inherent in self-interest. It's within the self-interest of humans to no longer have control of their decisions concerning their self-interest sure. lots right? of times that's true but lots of times that's not true uh, i just you know i just meant right? that's that's one of the ways that asimov is always spinning off these three laws yeah. right to generate these interesting in a certain way he is generating these philosophical problems because you know if, if you take the lose at his word in the, the preface to deficit repetition he says like a good book of philosophy should be part sci-fi, part detective novel, right? There's there's a sense in which mm-hmm. Asimov, this is why I like reading so, yeah. uh, at least his short stories, maybe not all of his, his stuff. And he wrote in every part of the Dewey Decimal System, you know, so I can't read all of his stuff. Nobody can, really, unless you're an Asimov Well, that's color, the thing, I guess. Taylor, but, that's, 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 do you know how that a chess computer, once you have seven pieces on the board, each person can figure out every single possible position into infinity? But then once you get to eight, nine, ten, then it has to really crank out stuff. And it can give you like some good answers and good moves, but the, it just becomes so, the problem right. becomes so massively complex right. yeah. so quickly that you're just fucked. And there's, there, yeah, lots of, lots of these problems, this, these possibilities of humanity and society. If it's chess pieces have that much complexity imagine what these problems have concretely with person to person if you're talking about interests right if you take away self from self-interest you have interests and then you have to have an interest you kind of have to have a, a causal idea right there has to be some there's something has to be kind of like happening or a transcendental idea has to be existing in some sense and to kind of make a a universal declaration that something will address all of these is, of course, you know, impossible. I mean, the, the idea of kind of reaching this, this place where you can have the right philosophical or right political views, which nobody except me has. Only I have all the right. No, I really, I really authentically do not even begin to think that. Um, <laughs> I do not. Because, because there are, are all these concrete problems of complex, which have such high levels of complexity Right. of um, of what's exactly happening in terms of you look at china right you look at workers and management you look at global capitalism and then you look at like this state 
which is harming these people and this. And then you say, well, obviously if I was one of these people, and I think I always go to, well, if I was one of these people being harmed and I didn't like it, I probably would probably say, fuck you. Yeah. Uh, maybe I would try to be a proper Prussian Hegelian, right? And be like a Chinese Communist Party member, redder than red, like G, redder than red. Isn't that fun? I feel like MLs are like, they, the more you try to like be pure Bolshevik, the more kind of, the more you start to harden in like awkward ways until you see like the Cuban ambassador talking to the uh, Chinese ambassador and they're all very, you could tell that the, that the, the fact of their power and influence in their self-reflection, it really is the cringe sun. It is like immediate. <laughs> and, and the cringe disc. They have a discourse about something, but they're never, it's never just the discourse, right? It's never just Elliot and Coop and Taylor. There's always like the cause is so bubbling through everything that it's hard to, it's hard to get into these kinds of interpersonal relations without, uh, without the totality rushing in, which is kind of a, which is kind of a terrifying place to be if you're used to liberal democracy. But of course, then you're in one of these, you're in one of these countries, right? And you're just, you're thrown into, like, imagine if you're thrown into one of these countries, we are not, but you're thrown into a country where every interpersonal discourse there's this possibility of the highest totality of the state rushing in and just fucking smacking you like really hard, like yep. killing you, imprisoning you, your family. Like that's pretty crazy, right? So in the level of complexity involved with that, you could even go witnessing game, right? <laughs> you kind of get a game there. Like what, how are you going to react to that? It's hard to think of, of um, myself as anything, but like I'm a very kind of, in liberal democracy, it's like, I really have the attitude of, what the fuck are you really going to do to me? Fucking nothing. Fuck off. Can't do shit. You know, if you piss off the wrong person where the totality is high enough, you could like, you know, you could really fucking hurt yourself and other people around you. So there's these ethical, moral questions. And then you get that times a million or times a billion. And you get these, it gets very complicated about proper stances, like proper takes, proper political views, right? This starts to remind me just what you've been kind of saying, this notion that the discourse about, you know, if we're, if we're talking about liberal democracy, we're talking about America or the West or whatever, this notion of cancel culture is this, this want, this desire to replicate something of this, where there is this higher, sure. this big, this big other that's going the totality to- Totality that can that, rush that's, in. That's, that's come, this need to be a victim <laughs> of this big other- yeah. Whereas we see, we see that in many times, not only are the effects of cancel culture not negative, they sometimes end up boosting the celebrity of, of those whom they're supposed to crush. Sure. Even if they, they, it's not like they even stop being mainstream. They just kind of shift to another bandwidth of the mainstream. Yeah. If that even makes sense, what I'm saying. No, no, it but definitely this, makes but this, sense. But this need, this need to, this need to imagine a symbolic other of the cancel culture with two capital C's like crushing down on our freedoms and our free speech. And, and yet their amplitude, their ability to, uh, to articulate themselves gets boosted. It's an interesting well, paradox. Yeah. Well, we do have it in the form of law, right? Law is this totality which rushes in. Cancel culture of the law. Law is the original cancel culture. You know what I right. mean? which is like, ah, you stole, now you're in jail, you're canceled. But in a certain sense, <laughs> cancel culture is a, is a means of trying to put a face, the leftist woke they, yeah. even if it's still kind of, it's, it's a faceless, it's the mask for the faceless they, the creeping totalitarian yeah, left or something. Well, they it, want, is, it is this they want desire to, to be demon. repressed, but but it ends up it ends up usually working out. Usually, I say usually, I mean like, it ends up in general. Well, it's, it's a desire to be repressed, but it's also a desire that anything means anything, right? You want things to be important and meaningful. Like you want this high, people afraid of cancel culture. They want the evil cancel culture people, which, you know, they, to some extent, there are some like whack people that are a bit hysterical out there. But, the, you know, there's sure. a lot of people, there's a lot, a lot more than cancel culture. What happens is people that deserve to be fucking removed from where they are are not like for instance mm -hmm. just in the entertainment industry you talk about me too you know i know i don't want to divorce too much i know people in the me too movement and it essentially 
the problem is not cancel culture. The problem is, you know, very wealthy people do not have any consequences. Whatsoever right. Yeah, exactly. For, right. for routinely sexually abusing. And this is, this is where otherwise abusing their power. Right. Cancel culture is like a slave morality approach. It's not any different from Christianity and it's like ulti- it's a cope ultimately, in my opinion. Into what, yeah, well, we, we can even use the phrase semblance once again, right? Can't the, In terms of the big other is semblance a little bit, which is the problem with, I think, Lacan in terms of uh, the big other. It's like, well, kind of, non-dupe error, kind of, but, but what if you get all these problems with this culture of, of semblance and why not be a revolutionary in regards to rationally analyzing what is semblance, what does the semblance purport to be a moral agent of, and what would real material, act or material would be used incorrectly. Let's be Hegelian. Actual consciousness in the world, capital A, actual, right? What would the actual, thorough actual engagement be with these, um, with the moral issue that's actually being brought up by these kind of semblance uh, right. things that we see in media or like once in a while, right? Right. Back in the day, you know, people that bitch about cancel culture are often the conservative and they look back with fondness on like these simpler times. But, you know, cancel culture used to be they would fucking tar and feather your ass, you or know, or ostracize you. For right. Or years. fucking, yeah, excommunicate Greece, you or whatever. Excommunication, exile, exile. Yeah. I mean, the whole. These are illegal judgments. Or, uh, no, well, no, not metaphorically. Not, not well, even but even with ostracization, you're casting lots. It's a democratic type of you know. You piss off enough people, but see that that's when that's when cultures were sure. e- the totalities were more microstructured, right? right? In yeah. terms of localities, whereas yeah. now cancel culture is literally like we, we've been saying this Lacanian big other, other right. that that's meant to be a kind of totality that you were discussing earlier with with more totalitarian regime so it's it's this kind of means of fabricating this totalitarian other to be crushed under it's that meme of the of the child with the boot on its head and he's, he's holding it <laughs> yeah. he's holding it down right in the other frame i guess that's kind of where the things have have shifted and yeah i mean it's there are other yeah. means too of not even banishment but like the pillory and stuff now i know that gets us back into these questions of law but these these different ways of what, what was it Lacan talks about? Uh, it's not the Fisherian Deridian ontology. I know you translate, so I'm like, it's, it's not it's, going to be something I know. It's going to be something like... No, 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 no. It's, it's, but- it's Lacan uh, <laughs> crafts the term ontology from the French word shame, right? Yeah. So Lacan's kind of like... Oh, fuck, was it McGowan who talks about this? Or uh, I think was it, it was. Was it Matthews? Uh, yeah, I think it was Matthews who was saying about, that we need to yeah. be reintegrate shame into reintegrating this culture of shame and so Lacan's notion which hasn't become the meme that the Fisherian and Deridian ontology has become with H-A-U ontology H-O-N-tology that's what uh, Matthews kind of brings up and it, it's it's one of Lacan's many you know um, I mean he was almost if not more so as prolific as Derrida with these with these puns and these portmanteau words but yeah I mean Maybe that's just Lacan didn't have time to like develop all these things, but he but he does kind of draw upon Lacan's uh, this notion of a there's not a good word for it in English you could translate it as just like a shame ontology, you know. You mean the boot on um, head, the self boot on head ontology? Well, well, that would be a self imposed type of that. W- I mean, I guess this this thing where yeah. it's the fact that just because you're shamed for your for your bullshit. You're free to say and act as you will, but you know the consequences. They may not be legal. They may be. They may just be sure. personal. They say, may be say, Taylor, interpersonal say you are and transpersonal. Sh- sure, but say you are shaming me for now. This is a negative identity, right? Okay, I, right. Uh, in terms of, I, I have things, and you're circling them. And they're bullshit, right? Right. So that this is all. You know, it's also a question of ego, right? And assert what is the power to identify this or that as bullshit. This is the only time I'm going to bring it up because I'm really not. I really, I'm really not supposed to. I'm well, I guess, it. I guess this would. But, be but where, like, but for yeah. instance, if you talk yeah. 0.2.0, 0.3.0, right? 
the circle war, the bullshit circle war, right? You can mm -hmm. say it's you could say it's ego, mm -hmm. but ultimate ultimately what the thing that um pushes it is a nicely Marxist thing. It doesn't matter well, you know, oh zero two point is bullshit because they left, or you know, my zero three point is this is actually a mechanism of capital takeover and for you know people being kicked from the things they labor to create. Right. But ultimately I kind of do like that this this I what is it? The identity war to circle each other, which is kind of like the game Go, right? It ultimately doesn't matter because one person can buy it. So you, you get a you get right, an. I feel right. like the, from the zero publishing thing, you get a nice Marxist lesson that beneath the ideals, there's this force of material, which is this overrules. Ideals yeah. can be added to that, but the ideals are not what you know. The material is the true force, and like, and that's why I kind of try to talk about in this book, right? Which is these ideas get power through these kinds of um, structures. I like to refer uh, to it as right. zombie will be, because it's it's a power which is not of any singular right. person, yeah. but it becomes institutional. Yeah. So once it's been, it's excised from the person and it's institutional, now it has this idea. Once uh, it takes on like a group, fantas a well, group yeah, fantasy. Well, group fantasy, but also kind of, um, you know, you talk of, you can talk of motive and and an idea, right? In terms of like the zero example, for instance, there's this kind of nice, interesting interplay here where there is this kind of Marxist dynamic, capitalist dynamic that's happening. Then there's this kind of very simple idea, which is understandable that Mark Fisher left zero, founded Repeater, and now Repeater's now owns this again, right? And then what's kind of getting kind of getting pushed under the rug is like, okay, there's these are both kind of um they're kind of mutually exclusive ideas a little bit. But they're really not because they're they're both happening. I wonder if if we could take a moment to kind of make sense of this of this very kind of Hegelian thing which is actually happening now in terms of there's this kind of okay leftist publication you have a leftist publication you have a originator you have a creator of this right you want to talk about you know communing with the dead communing with mark fisher i imagine mark fisher himself would do would kind of support whatever his buddies would do right so you can imagine if you're communing with the dead of some kind that he would of course support whatever his kind of uh, comrades would do you could also look at it as very accelerationist using the mechanisms of capital for a goal. And I th still think the question is the same question of China, which is China's a socialist country, but then there's ultimately what is, what is this remainder kind of worker real? What is the real of a, like for instance, somebody labors on something for like half a decade and it's shown as this original thing, but it's not this original, you know, Mark Fisher. Mark Fisher's not a YouTuber, you know? <laughs> Hello Zero Books readers, that's not Mark Fisher. And now it's kind of recaptured. Now Doug Lane is being posited as Mark Fisher by somebody, by somebody else who's a you know, fellow millennial podcaster group. It is a very interesting dialectical moment. I, I feel like I don't want to, I feel like it's interesting to hold it in your head and see what's happening and see that there is a kind of real, you can feel it. You can feel the real return sometimes, can't you? You can feel the real returning that there is this kind of process happening. It's too early for me to see what the what the future will hold in terms of your your example of of zero and the reboot or zero two point oh or whatever you want to call it. You know, it's. Um, I think what's going to happen is you know what's going to happen is there's going to be a second publication and that's going to put out things. Right. Right. Um, yeah. But I, I think besides what's going to happen with that is what's going to happen with this antagonism, I think is very unclear. Yeah. Right. I know that Craig's trying to do his his best over at Acid Horizon to, to sort of give them a, a platform for what they foresee in the future. And I think that's a, I think that's an admirable thing. Sure. You know, well, it's totally I, understandable, of course, in terms yeah. of this, of you're like, oh, you're going to do this. It's like, oh, okay. He's the right guy to to do it in terms of I have faith in his integrity and his creativity and his uh, his work ethic to name a few things sure, that, that, that sure. if someone is going to be doing doing that, at least that part of the 
whether you call it rebranding or just, um, you know, I know he's going to be taking on a, wearing a bunch of hats, rebranding, marketing, outreach, public relations. I mean, he's, he's going to do all of that, it seems like, and more. They got a good person to do that. And so that at least is a is a good sign. But that's only one small piece of the puzzle that that you're talking about, right? Well, yeah, I well, mean, the totality and complexity is extremely vast, right? Right, yeah. In terms of the chess computer example, the ethical <laughs> implications of this process are, you know, it's, it'd be really hard to calculate. I yeah. think the thing that I would, I would bring up would be that this is a thing which Doug Lane created this platform, that, which he used from Mark Fisher's original publication. So there's these, this in, interesting contradiction, right? Right, right. Between like, so Mark Fisher creates zero books, right? Mark Fisher creates zero books. Doug Lane makes a YouTube platform, which is very particular to him. Then Zero Books sees this platform, reclaims it as their own, which is not something they labored to create. And in fact, freely exited out and made a second press and mm-hmm. then got rid of the people who created it. Right. So this is this. What is this? But, you know, process of capital. It's a, it's a monstrous alpha bung, right? It, but yeah, but ethically, of course, if you take it into pure egoism, I feel like then you get the, tr- you know, the truth of the matter. You get to the back of the matter. Right. right? Is mine. Give it back capital i don't care how i'm getting i'm going to get it back i'm going to do this but you are taking you know five years of something which was labor to create and then you're positing it as the original thing and then you know ultimately i think there's you know there's another question which is what is leftism in general and like what is the worth of these kind of interpersonal backs and forths which you know it's negligible if any in terms of what is what is the real work but, you know, even there, I would say that's where Doug has the real argument, which is he's, he's the worker kind of being fucked in this kind of culture war. We're all kind of gleaning a little bit. Very complicated, very complicated thing. But of course, Doug is not the only leftist worker. There's the fucking entire world. So, yeah, the ethical complexity, Hydra, I think it will nicely emerge from this antagonistic thing. Luckily, there, you know, at what is it? Everything is in utter chaos in terms of finding solutions to the situation is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> what else do we want to talk about, fellas? Well, I think we can approach things. The thing you scrolled to very briefly was the dry and wet passage, which I think is a really important. I think one of this idea is that you can reflect on something psychoanalytically. I was reflecting there, talking all of this kind of logically speaking, but there is a very kind of, um, there's a notion in this book that if you speak to me, like I said, give the master, master will never give you the tools to, to uh, take down his own house. I always feel like if you want to rhetorically best me, you really just should use my tools because I'll fuck, I'll give you the tools, man. I really, I really, I really will try. For instance, you can take signifiers, right? Psychoanalytic discourse is an ult- is an ultimately kind of um, undermining discourse, right? So, what is the enjoyment? So, if you speak to enjoyment, right, and you speak to signifiers, if you're to psychoanalytically interview somebody, you're not going to focus on the logic of what they're saying. You'll focus on a signifier, or you'll mm-hmm. focus on the method of enjoyment, right? Yeah. So. I would say, you know, whatever, whatever we talk about next, we can keep that in mind, which is this, there's a, a mode of kind of reflection, which is, which is kind of a psychoanalytic, which, which is part of self-interest, right? A second movement of an initial kind of logic. You can then, you can articulate something, but um, you're not quite fighting it. You're not de-articulating it insofar as you're fighting the notion, but in fact, you know, as Deleuze would say, coming at it from, you're buggering it or whatever. But the reason why it's not a simple buggering in the negative sense is ideally you're sublating the person to a uh, symptom free, this ideal of mental health, right? Which, which I do believe in. I do believe in this kind of ideal of mental health, that there is this kind of notion of psychoanalysis where you don't know the end point, where you are kind of taking things through its enjoyment or through the signifiers that you're bringing towards, you're bringing someone towards something as you do that. So I said earlier <laughs> that I would try to create an assemblage of Elliot Cooper and Taylor. And, and, and I was just like, I wonder what that would entail. And of course, there are all these other assemblages already pre-existing, which, you know, which makes it more fun. 
you know, makes the situation chaos excellent. So I asked Cooper the question first, and then Cooper kind of handed it to you. I want to ask you a slightly different question because you're a translator, which is not something most people can do, especially in the theory world, especially I would say millennial. I don't know if you're, you're a millennial, right? You're a fellow millennial. Sure. Yeah. Or you as a zoomer, you never know. So that's a very unique skill. So if you're, if you're a a translator of these kind of theory texts, it's going to give you a kind of really different perspective in terms of both the purpose of the texts and also your purpose in engaging with these texts and giving these texts a, a wider audience, right? Mm-hmm. I, ha- I have a therapy license, so I see myself, you know, I'm engaging with things in a mental health kind of way. Maybe if somebody talks to me, maybe I can make everyone a little less fucking like neurotic if I'm like in this situation. That's like, you know, you have these ideas of purpose and meaning, right? In that kind of vein, what are you translating? What's the most recent thing you translated? Or what's something that you've translated that's kind of meaningful to you? That's been yeah. kind of interesting. You know, I started getting interested in translation through, as an undergrad, reading, you know, Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus and, and many of other Deleuze's works and saw that, and that really got me interested in psychoanalysis and reading Lacan's work and the bootlegs. I was always inspired by many of the bootlegs you can find either from the, the Ireland Society is one of them that, that does a lot of those. Yeah, I've that, seen those that, that really inspired me and, and made me think that translating could be something where you don't necessarily have to be an expert. You don't necessarily have to have a contract, right? This notion of fair use. So when I started translating, I started I wanted to read these thinkers that weren't translated, like Raymond Rie and Gilbert Simondon and fucking Guattari, right? He had The Machine Reckon Conscious was the first book I did. I wanted to read this book because I saw how much of Guattari's work, solo work, wasn't translated and how important he was in that, in their little assemblage. And uh, but before I did that, you know, I had a blog and I was writing essays and stuff and but I, I found myself more interested in in getting access to these works that weren't available especially like Rie, who's just a fucking weird amazing underappreciated at least in English and in French too he's kind of an obscure guy but the Liz you know you can see the parts where he shows up in his, in his corpus and I started translating little bits of Rie, and I, I'd be like oh well you know I'll put it on the blog right and that forced me to take it seriously because then it wasn't just then you're not just like putting it through google translate then you're actually like okay well do i fucking understand what i'm translating and it because of my background in english you know i it started off being bad translations that i would then fix with english and slowly start to learn the language that way translating little little bits of miche serre who's another crazy like polymath guy translating bits of guattari Oh, interesting. Um, with, so you're learning uh, this language via translation. Yeah, via translation. Totally. As just, well. just totally because I had background in Spanish and Latin, but never did translating with them. Right. Just kind of taking the, the language courses that you need. And then uh, I emailed Silver Lotringer, who recently passed away, but he ran Semiotext. I sent him like a pretty rough draft of the introduction to the machine unconscious and was like, hey, I had no right. I took little balls, but who cares, right? Because if he says no, then he says no. He said yes. That became my first real project because everything else was just bootlegs that I threw on on the blog. You know, I was translating like obscure French authors who published in the Rue Mon conference that's famous, like Deleuze published there, Leotard, Foucault, and all these guys. And I published like these, these little guys like Pierre Boudot, who had this beautiful reading of Zarathustra and shit like that. So I got my beak wet. I got the contract, did Guattari. At that point, by that point, I was, I started being interested in Laura Well and struck up a correspondence with him, was able to do two of his books. But really what I was doing at that point, I kind of, the Laura Well phase of my translation went into hyperdrive and I boot like the shit out of all of all, all these essays he was, was just non philosophy yeah non philosophy stuff so yeah. like so like a lot of his work at that time especially is that even today his essays a lot of them still aren't uh, oh yeah my available. wife had your book he had your non philosophy translation 
Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've got about <laughs> I've got about eighteen or nineteen. Hey, my wife. Hey, my wife had your translation. What's your translation? <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's it's great. Wife's. I mean, I, I I've translated almost translate about 15 I, I can't even keep count of it anymore I, I did a bunch of those are just bootlegs that I put on a new blog that I did just for like translations of him and at that time I started getting an interest in Simon Don I'd always had an interest in but I that was the book I want I wanted to do three books Machine and Conscious Philosophy and Non-Philosophy by Laura Well and uh Gilbert Simon Don's book yeah this is the one you should it's check out it's called yeah. I got a copy here. It's called Individuation in Light of Notions of Form and Information. Now, this is the book fuck. that... Oh, fuck. That looks... That's an epic title. You know I, I know it is. I call it... I call it... I like I them. call I call it Ilfi. Because <laughs> it, it is a fucking mouthful. But the yeah. Individuation book, you can just call it... He, individuation book. Okay, got he, it. He, he, <laughs> that was his primary dissertation in 58. And it's hugely influential for all of... Deleuze's work, including his work with Watery, and you can see it. And the more I read of Simon Don, and also when you when you read the like really scholarly Deleuze, the the really I, I say the really good scholars. There's there's so many I haven't read, but the, when I was like deep into balls deep into Deleuze scholarship, like with Daniel Smith, and um, you know I'll leave a bunch of people out if I name more. But Daniel Smith, I could tell reading his. I actually printed off his dissertation and like read it like a Bible. <laughs> this is how I got to know all these minor thinkers of Deleuze, not just the big ones like Spinoza and and Bergson, etc. But you could see that Simon Don was a missing link in for me, like my understanding of Deleuze scholarship. And so that was the big. That was like the whale. That was like the white whale. And I bugged the head of University of Minnesota Press since like 2008 to do the book. And it kept falling through translators' hands for various reasons, because it's a big project. And finally, by the time I'd finished the Laura Well, they were at a point where they had already gone through, they had a team of five translators on it, and it fell through again. And so it kind of landed in my lap. That just came out last November in two volumes. And right before it came out, my father passed. So when that came out, I was like, thank God I did the one thing on earth, if I remembered or if I, if I matter in this, in this one lifetime I have, being married to my wife is, is one thing. And that's my self-interest. That's my own little narcissistic thing. But the one thing that the other thing that I wanted to do or I have wanted to do and had a passion for was to get this fucking book done. I've wanted that since I started translating shit for the blog so now that that's out it's been a year it's been really rough for me like psychologically to get back in that headspace of translating after blowing my load on the biggest of the three but now i'm back translating i'm doing another translation of simon don right now his course on perception which he gave in 64 65 i'm finishing that i've got about 45 pages left i'm hoping to send that off because it's very overdue, <laughs> but I also have another Laurel translation that I'm doing with a friend, uh, one of his big works, and uh, I, I have a third project I'm hoping to finish up that's yeah. secondary scholarship on Deleuze. I've been trying to get new projects to do because after finishing the three that I started with, I kind of was in no man's land. It was like, well, I can relate to you in terms of, yeah. you know, I, I don't talk about this publicly ever, but my mother passed away fairly recently. And this was while, while I was doing this, while I was doing this book, there's this kind of question of what are these philosophical things that I'm doing as a family member is dying? What is their relation to my relation to philosophy? Right. Right. Yeah, it is um, that kind of dynamic of kind of investigating philosophical texts while dealing with trauma uh, massive trauma, you know, massive trauma, right? Massive traumas is, is you know, it really both questions your engagement in it, and it also radically kind of it puts you back in it because right. you realize you realize there is a kind of a necessity there, even if uh, mom and dad don't get what the kids are singing about. I don't know what your experience is because you know some people have parents very engaged with philosophy i think i don't know i don't know any my, my, well my, my mom was a librarian and she collected uh, all, she collected all the every little publication i did 
it started off with essays and in, in journals and stuff. But, you know, now that I guess that it, it did take me a year to get over my dad passing and I just wasn't in the headspace to I just didn't have the drive anymore. Right. But I've I've actually just in this past Freud says in Morning and Melancholia, it's like I don't know where he gets the data from or if it's just from his experience from the clinic, but he does say it's like 12 to 18 months is about the normal period of time to like mourn. And I do feel like that it's, it's been, it's pretty much been close to 18 months and I'm, I'm feeling that, that spark again, just to wrap all this up. The whole reason I started translating did start off as self-interest. I wanted to be able to read these things that, I didn't necessarily think would get done if I didn't do them. And mm. then that self-interest kind of translated to the point where once I got a little facility, once I felt like they were able to be shared with the broader community, it did start as bootlegs. Cause as I said, with the Lacanian bootlegs, that was super inspirational to me, you know, just as a side note. And so that self-interest kind of translated into, well, now that, now that I think this is valuable, others should should be able to have this as well and since well, I'm a a, failed, well, it's a great service to yeah. be able to provide such a text you're not just thinking you're thinking yourself obviously but you're giving to people these things they would not otherwise have access to right? yeah and that and that's kind of like don't hide your light under a bushel or whatever right you know there's no reason for it to merely be private if it I've never heard that saying. <laughs> uh, that's that's kind of a. Christian I've heard the Mel Brooks. If you've got, have you heard? If you've got it, flaunt it. By yeah, Mel Brooks. I, that, yeah, that's a kind of a Bible <laughs> a Bible school song. You know, um, this little lot of mine. I'm going to let it shine. You've probably heard yeah. that. Oh probably. yeah, I've heard that. This okay, is, so it's that's like, basically. I'm Jewish, but I know, I know. <laughs> you, you mentioned that in the book. I just, uh, you know, it's it's that point where, I mean, if I could, I would. A lot of the essays that I've had published in journals, I publish them on the blog first. And I always ask, hey, I'll take it down if you want. And most of the time they're like, they don't care. What I care as a failed academic, I still have like one kind of foot in academia where I would like academics. I would like scholarship, Anglophone scholarship to be able, when they think I'm going to cite this thing, they're like, even if there's an MLA format for it, they're like, I'm not going to cite a fucking blog post. There's still that hierarchy, right? So yeah. I do like when earlier blog posts, earlier essays that I've translated can be, whether integrated in a book like this or be published in an official journal where then they think, okay, that's authoritative. You know, you're, you're right. still in this kind of master discourse shit, right? Or well, that's the discourse. leader, right? In terms of, yeah. of like, if you want to, if you want to, there's the cause of philosophy, right? Full circle, the cause of philosophy. Who am I in this cause, Right. Also, who am I in terms of expertise, right? Right. There are all, yeah. these, all these questions of ego and interest kind of come up and they can't help but to bend the logics towards it, the logics that you're pulling out. But of course, that you are, in fact, an agent doing all of these things, a kind of causal agent, right? And an agent affected upon and an agent whose material is, uh, whose kind of psyche is the object as well, so. Something, something, chess complexity, seven moves, infinite, <laughs> and impossible, and so on. It's very, it's very chessical. That would be my ultimate, I feel like the ultimate meme book. If I was like just a little better at chess, I would love to write the philosophy of chess, which is, I feel like it's like Zizek in the clinic. It's like a secret desire. I feel like the reason why Zizek in the clinic worked in terms of just like writing something that's interesting, I feel like it was a mutual fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Zizek in the clinic was a mutual fantasy. This Ego in its hyper state, this is like some real fucking hardcore personal shit that I've been working on doing oh, wow. altruism, altruism research in grad school, Sterner, Rand, going to the fucking Rand Institute, arguing with fucking objectivists. <laughs> Did you really? Awesome. I, I, awesome. I, I talked with Jordan Peterson. He said, I said, I'm refuting you. Good luck. And I also messaged Slavoj Zizek and I gave him some tips. I said, he's a psychologist. Don't under any circumstances let him talk to you. And then you, but then he feels good. Like your buddies afterward. I said, don't do that. And I heard him on RT. He repeated something that I said. in email. Uh, Nice. Good. And then he fucking didn't. And then Jordan Peterson lost his mind. But besides the point, I don't relish the fact that a man lost his mind. What was it? You cited something that Zizek said repeatedly to you, this notion that he would trade his, he would sell his. He didn't say, his, Oh no, he didn't, that he didn't he say. Would say, say 
Well, that's oh. everybody. But he he would <laughs> sell his mother into slavery if he could for, have beef for Vendetta too, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Because I assume he wants to see how the logic would work in the post-revolution. That's classic, classic Zizek notion, which is the moment of violence isn't the real thing. That's yes. not the right. This is why you quote the Livy, you have the Livy quote, right? Was it Livy with about the two different creatures, right? The man fighting for his freedom and then yeah. rationally kind of instituting order afterwards. Yeah, revolution should not be seen as a as a, an orgasmic moment. Damn. Right? Revolution is I mean you can tweet it out, Coop. This is where you, this is where you could disagree, you know. <laughs> but I, but in but in terms of like his whole his whole notion is that the orgasmic moments are within the discourse of strongly within the discourse of capitalism. And that's why well, he calls, yeah. He calls, he calls himself, uh, what is it? Like a conservative centrist communist or whatever, just cause you wouldn't say centrist. He'd say cons- slightly socially conservative communist, which makes sense if you, uh, right. Yeah. If you're like an 80 year old man or 70 year old man from <laughs> Yugoslavia, wait, he's from, uh, Slovenia, right? Yeah, Slovenia. Yeah, but I was gonna say, Coop, you should tweet that out about what revolution revolution shouldn't be orgasmic. Is that was that we said the revolutionary moment? Yeah, the revolutionary. Well, that's the Zizek idea, right? Okay. Um, in terms of revolution, isn't hey? Isn't, I mean, isn't the orgasmic this is moment. this is a communistic assemblage. So memes and and tweets and you know, it's, there's no stealing yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. It's communal property, right? I mean, I take hell. your property and I'm I'm appropriating it. Yeah, yeah. There's, but there's, but, no, but, but, there's but no unfortunately, it's all ra- distributed equally. I feel like we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. But Coop, what if rationality is the real thing, and you can't? None of us can grasp that. But oh I'm fuck about that. So I'm kind of grasping it. Well, I roll. I roll a natural twenty in rationality. <laughs> what I want to maybe wrap up on this. I wanted to be sure to hit upon. I think what's interesting about your approach to egoism in the book and just in general is. You know, you ground it in the social rather than I think the preconceived, you know, a lot of people come with their preconceived notions. You discussed this early on in the book, right, about what people think about egoism, right? There's a tremendous amount of baggage, right? So I don't know if you could perhaps disaggregate your vision of egoism and how grounded within the social, within the within the community. Well, it has right. If you have part two, section C, right? What's universal, what's causal, what's communal, interpersonal. So part C in terms of the social. So it's not grounded in the social totally because it has this idea that there is this rational ideal within the social to some extent, right? So self-interest can then be sublated into the social, right? So then self-interest becomes in a moment purely social. And we have a purely kind of social moment. Like I had a social moment where before we had any content, when it was purely abstract, I said, let's see an assemblage, Elliot Cooper Taylor assemblage. And that's a, that's a social self-interest, right? It's like here, let's create a social relation. And then these causes, these other relations are the history of our lives. They bleed in, don't they? And they kind of come in and they soak it. It turns it, and the idea that why it's a hyperstate, why this self-interest jumps, or you could say in post-nut clarity, why you suddenly desire orgasming, and then you orgasm, and it's gone. What's what does it mean? So that's why it's the hyperstate. This is the hyperstate of the ego substance of the substance of self-interest as these wills, as these vectors, as self-interest, self-interest morphs and becomes and distorts everything. It distorts our plans. It becomes unrecognizable to itself from one moment to another, unless you know it as, you know, self-interest, as kind of egoism's dirty lizard people secret, that it is this shape-shifting lizard person of self-interest, and it just cannot stop being that. It turns into an ideal. It turns into a communal thing. It turns in, it becomes negative in an internal psyche. It becomes articulated and, and it becomes articulated and it lacks, right? You know, so the social implications is when you're when you're engaging with a zombie idea, you're engaging with self-interest. If I tried to destroy Coca-Cola, I don't think I could. Pretty strong, that idea. I mean, well, I'm going to destroy Coca-Cola a can. I'm going to destroy their can. What am I get? There's these ideas of self-interest being, it's both an object. It's both not living. It's both living. It's both an element and it's, and also our total essential kind of 
nature, it's an, an essential nature we cannot escape, right? And I think that's another thing I want to emphasize, which is it's a dimension of reality, right? As you investigate reality and as people do philosophy and understand different relations and mechanisms of how things link to each other or how understanding a concept better, this might not be covered by the ego and its type. A dimension of it will be, but that dimension is not everything. You don't have to know the rational. It's like you don't have to be cringe. You don't have to take the sun. You don't have to say, oh, so you're doing the sun. You're a sun god, right? You don't have to then rationalize it, although you can. It might have positive effects. But that's kind of the purpose, which is there is a dimension of self-interest of this lizard person. And if you want to know what it is, you should buy my book, The Ego and Its Hyperstate, A Psychoanalytically Informed Dialectical Analysis of Self-Interest by Zero Books, which I'm an author for. Zero Books for all your fine book needs. Right, fella, Felix? So oh, yeah. Based. Uh, <laughs> Based in dialectical <laughs> dream theory pilled. Yeah, or or to be or to fully hyper or to be hy- fully hyperstated. Also check out 1968 Press and Diet Soap. These are two other theory presses, much like zero books. You can follow all of them and it's quite easy to go on youtube.com, follow Zero Books, who are nice enough to publish this. You can follow Diet Soap, which is Doug Lane, and you can follow 1968 Press, which is Alfie Bound, who wrote a very nice book about Candy Crush and capitalism for Zero Books. He also wrote PlayStation Dream World, and he's also doing my talk in London, which is, I don't know how, how long it'll take to edit this, but I'm going to London, and I'm doing a book reading uh, next Saturday, which is from now to December 12th. Uh, so it'll be a good time. And, you know, as we move forward in our lives, you know, the situation may be chaotic under the sun, but that the situation is uh, excellent. I mean, I'm a chaosifer, so you know, that, <laughs> the situation yeah. is definitely excellent. Yeah. <laughs> As the last line, wait, what's the last line in the book? What's the last line in the book? Are you, you not entertained? Line? That's it. I'll let you say it. Are you yeah. not entertained? Are you not entertained? There you, <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. Throw us a buck a month at our Patreon. Are you not entertained? (laughs) Hell yeah. All of my life force goes into this thing. God bless you, sir. Well, Elliot, uh, we appreciate you coming back to talk to us about about the new book. And uh, that will wrap up this edition of the Machine to Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. Bye, y'all. Are you not entertained? (laughs) Of negativity and singularity. Including the ultimate form of security, which is unconscious care. To the whole state of things, a cure of violence without object at all. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. What I meant is the following. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, Logotomized people, as in a block work orange.